I, I'm assuming, uh, Rachel didn't tell me quite what she had in mind, but I'm assuming that, that Marilyn is here kind of representing somebody who really cares about the risks. Maybe Rick represents somebody focused on rewards and Jim, somebody who's focused on regulations. Uh, and if that's so, then, then I'm not sure what R is left for me. Uh, I, I'm hoping it won't be rambling or redundant, but we'll, we'll let you decide. So I, I'm gonna go with resilient. It's not there, but that, that would be the R I would pick. Uh, and I'm gonna ask you though, not to imagine whatever usually comes to your mind uh, when you hear resilient. Okay, and, and this is a broader uh, uh, appeal, um, a, a broader plea. Um, I would also ask you, uh, don't imagine your usual responses to risks or rewards or regulations. I, I, I would implore you, please believe me, uh, that Marilyn and Rick and Jim are smart, thoughtful, and caring people. So please don't pigeonhole them uh, as a greenie talking about risks, an industry guy talking about uh, rewards, and a government man uh, talking regulations. Because it, it may be true that Marilyn spends uh, a lot of her time thinking about conservation, and Rick is in the business of making money, and Jim is with an agency uh, charged with regulating industry. Uh, but I know my fellow panelists uh, to be caring people they care about Alaska, the Arctic, uh, the climate, and the future, regardless of whatever it says on their business cards. And I, I would suggest that we uh, do them and ourselves uh, a great disservice if we pigeonhole them uh, in some narrow construct of greenie, robber baron, and regulatory tyrant. <laughs> the violence we do them as real human beings with hearts and souls, I think, is obvious. But the violence we do ourselves may be less obvious. When we label them with uh, pat terms, we miss the opportunity to be in a, a rich and very important conversation. These are people, like all of us in the auditorium, who have been moved by the wonders of the Arctic. And if we dismiss them with a mere label, uh, we miss finding out how it is that they are inclined to do something different than we would with that wonder. <clears throat> I suspect that each of them, and probably each of us here today, agree that the Arctic is wondrous and worthy of our attention. We all, I suspect, want to provoke that same wonder in our children and their children. In other words, we want the Arctic to be resilient. Marilyn and Rick and Jim, and you and I would like to say to our grandchildren that we were part of a group effort that kept the Arctic intact, productive, and well-managed, resilient. So here you are surrounded by leaders from the native community, industry, NGOs, municipal, state, and federal governments, all who share an interest in a resilient Arctic. Let's take stock of this commonality and avoid fixating on the different lenses we each look through. Indeed, our grandchildren will be little impressed if we say, I tried to maintain the Arctic wonders, uh, but the other guys did not approach it properly. In other words, the way I do. The Alaska legislature uh, produced with leadership of Reggie and, and many others, a remarkably thoughtful and forward-looking document on Arctic policy. They did it by having long and considered conversations with many, many constituents. A year ago, the federal government released a national strategy for the Arctic region. Its production was not as well vetted and discussed with people on the ground as the state effort, but it nonetheless advanced federal attention to and thinking about the Arctic. Our children will be best served by, taking, by us taking the best of those documents and many others and figuring out how to advance a resilient Arctic. My own lenses have been focused on Arctic research for many years. In that sphere, we also have multiple perspectives. The community of Arctic researchers, 
self-organized, and produced blueprints for future research under the auspices of the Study for Environmental Arctic Change, research. Jamie Morrison here uh, was a very key mover in that. Uh, subsequently, the federal agencies produced a five-year research plan under the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. Well, you could pigeonhole those efforts as bottom-up and top-down, respectively, but it's more useful uh, to have the recognition of how similar uh, they are in identifying the importance of the ice melt that Rachel referred to for society and ecosystems. The pace of change in the Arctic environment clearly is a huge challenge to the region's real resilience and to our grandchildren. So please keep discussing these issues with your colleagues, your neighbors, and most importantly, those you don't usually talk to. I hope you'll forgive my philosophical ramblings. Uh, I did not want my art to be rambling, so thank you. Well, Brendan, I've said before, you're always a tough act to follow. Thank you very much for those uh, great words. Uh, before I start, I've got to make a, a couple announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, a thank you to Rachel. Thank you for the invite. And this is a warning to everybody else. I spoke to Rachel at the reception last year and said how great it was. Now I'm on two panels. <laughs> so be very careful. <laughs> Uh, third of all, second of all, if you like some of the comments you're hearing today, there is a panel tomorrow, a breakout group, that's really going to be good. It's going to involve not only myself, uh, Bohm, that has the offshore energy, but also uh, the state of Alaska that has offshore and onshore energy, the BLM, and the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. So in an hour, if you really want to know what's going on for energy development in Alaska, come to the panel tomorrow. All righty, let's see if I can get this right here. Okay, that's who I am. And of course, is it going to work? There we go. What is a BOEM? Some people don't understand who or what we are. Well, I fr I'm from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Our primary responsibilities are to manage the development of the energy and mineral resources on the outer continental shelf in an environmentally and economically responsible way. Now, first of all, what is the OCS? Well, if you go to a, one of the states and you swim out to the state boundary, which is usually about three miles most of the time, well, from three miles to 200 miles out is the outer continental shelf. For the entire United States, the continental United States, Hawaii, and Alaska, that adds up to 1.76 billion acres. Guess where one billion acres is? Alaska, okay? So one billion of the 1.76 billion acres of the Outer Continental Shelf are in Alaska. My agency is responsible for managing the energy and mineral development. We implement a five-year oil and gas leasing program as per the OCS Lands Act. We don't do it because it's a fun thing to do, it's the law. Uh, we manage the OCS exploration, development, and production we do all the environmental reviews, such as by the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, things of that nature. We do studies. In the state of Alaska alone, predominantly in the Arctic, my bureau has invested over $450 million in research. We also look at the resources that are there. Talking about oil and gas, how much is there? My agency or my bureau is the one that tries to estimate that to try to manage what's going on, and we manage the geological and geophysical data that's, that's brought in. If I get the right button. Okay, now this slide is a little busy, but I call this, this is what is all the fuss about, all right? Now, these are the planning areas of the outer continental shelf, that one billion acres of the 1.76 billion acres. Because of the work that's been done, most of the interest in oil and gas on the OCS in Alaska is either in Cook Inlet, which is not in the Arctic, or the Chukchi or the Beaufort Sea, all right? Tred mentioned some information about how much we think is up there, estimated. In the Chukchi, there's estimated to be about 15 billion barrels of oil. In the Beaufort Sea, 
8 billion, billion, billion barrels of oil. That comes out to about 23 billion barrels of oil. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not a geologist or a geophysicist or a petroleum engineer. Those numbers don't mean anything. So I sat the geologist down and said, talk to me in something I understand. I said, okay, Jim, you're familiar with the Transalaxia pipeline. Yeah, TAPS. Well, since TAPS went online, there has been 17 billion barrels of oil has gone through it. Hmm, 17 billion barrels of oil, and there's 15 there and maybe eight there. Okay. Then they say, stop, Jim. You spent 11 years in the Gulf of Mexico. In the Gulf of Mexico, in about 50 years of activity, about 16 billion barrels have been produced in 50 years out of the Gulf of Mexico. So 16 in the Gulf of Mexico, 17 already through TAPS, 15 billion and 8 billion, I think I got it, okay? That's how I understand this. Now, compare this circumpolarly, all right? Just throw this up. There's Alaska down there with the, the little purple star. If you take into account the 23 billion barrels that might be there that's estimated in what's on shore in the Arctic, it comes out to 28 billion barrels. Look at those other countries. Russia, Canada, Denmark. We may not have the largest land mass, but our friends at the US Geological Survey say we might be the big kahuna. So that's why oil and gas companies are interested in the offshore of Alaska. All righty, lease sales. We have lease sales. We give, have these auctions that give the companies a right to submit exploration plans. It doesn't give them the right to do anything other than to give, turn in an exploration plan that pending approval, then they can put in an application to permit to drill to my sister agency, Bessie. So all it does, a lease, is give them the right to start the process. Now, in the state of Alaska, in the OCS, over 37 years, there have been 25 lease sales, 25 lease sales. In the Arctic that we're talking about, the Chukchi and the Beaufort, the Chukchi, there have been three lease sales. In the Beaufort, there have been 10 lease sales in those 37 years, all right? Now, I'm gonna jump ahead just for a second, and this kind of surprises people. In those two areas, which is larger than the Gulf of Mexico, where we have been looking at it for 37 years, close to 40, there are no offshore platforms there are no pipelines. The only production coming out of the U.S. Arctic OCS is North Star. Now, North Star is a gravel island in state waters where there's drilling that taps into a joint federal state reservoir. So in 37 years, 13 lease sales, we're at the very, very beginning of oil and gas exploration and development in the Arctic. It's a slow process. There has been drilling. Now, as you saw on the slide before, there have been lease sales other places, but they never panned out. And, and the drilling here, basically the same thing has occurred, that after 37 years and 86 exploration wells, the attention now is, of course, Cook Inlet, but the Beaufort Sea and the Chukchi. 31 exploration wells drilled in the Beaufort, six in the Chukchi. The last two exploration wells that were drilled we're in 2012, that was Shell, one in the Beaufort, one in the Chukchi. But they were only top hole wells. They did not get into the oil bearing zone. Why? Because they did not have the proper safety equipment online and working, a capping and containment system. Therefore, working with the regulatory group of our agency, Bessie, and Mark Fessmeyer is hiding in the back, they were not allowed to go into the oil bearing zone because they weren't ready. We weren't being mean, we were just being cautious. Well, those two wells that were drilled in 2012 in the Beaufort, that was the first well drilled in 10 years. The one in the Chukchi, that was the first well drilled in 20 years. So that sort of puts things in perspective. Okay, another thing that's kind of neat, uh, Lawson gave a great talk this morning in terms of activity and shipping and things. I asked one of my staff, uh, who's a presidential management fellow and uh, really brilliant, on try to give me a handle on this. So what he did is he went to the Coast Guard, got some Coast Guard data, and it showed the increase in shipping through the Bering Straits from 2008 to 2013. 
Then we looked at vessels only in the U.S. Arctic, 2008 to 2013, and you can see the increase. Well, looking at 2012, where the oil and gas armada was up there to drill those two wells, well, in the U.S. Arctic, all of the ships they had, I believe it was 22, only made up 10% of the vessels working in the U.S. Arctic at that time. If you look at the Bering Strait transits, considering that those vessels for oil and gas were going to one place and back, we're kind of guesstimating it's sometimes apples and oranges. It's probably less than 5%, somewhere between 3 and 5% of the transits were oil and gas. Then in 2013, where there was no drilling, but there were geological and geophysical boats up there and research boats, those vessels associated with oil and gas activity only made up about 2% of the vessels in the U.S. Arctic and probably only 1% of the transits. So it's kind of a way of seeing, okay, who's doing what up there and where, where they're at. If you look at the far left-hand corner, that's a reminder to me. And one of my Coast Guard colleagues pointed that out, that vessels involved in oil and gas exploration, you know, they're really heavily, you know, uh, monitored and, and regulated. They have marine mammal observers, there are speed requirements, there's oil spill response uh, requirements. They have all that. They're watched. What about all those other vessels in the far left there? That's what gives some people, you know, heartburn and keeps them up at night. Okay, um, the new five-year plan, and this just happened, and I'm sorry there's a lot of words on this slide, but my staff put it together for me because I was in Barrow. January 27th, and this is why the presentation was late, Rachel, uh, the Secretary of the Interior announced our draft proposed program for 2017 to 2022. In that draft proposed program, this is the very beginning, no decisions have been made, nothing final, it just starts the conversation. It is proposed to have one lease day on the Chukchi and one in the Beaufort toward the end of the program. That is intentional, so we have time to get more scientific information, have more consultations, get more traditional knowledge, see what we learn if there's any drilling next or this year in 2015. So those lease sales were put at the end of the program so we can learn as much as we can. At the same time, the president came out with an announcement the exact same day where there were five areas taken off the table. Four of those area, two in the Chukchi and two in the Beaufort, in our current five-year plan are already deferral areas, areas that are not available to lease. The president now has said, not only are we not gonna consider them, we're protecting them for good. Well, those areas were decided by us in the ongoing five-year program based on Western science and traditional knowledge. I cannot emphasize that enough. The 25-mile buffer along the coast of the Chukchi, using our oceanographers and those from NIMS and other and Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA, and working with the native hunters and whalers, it became quite evident that within 25 miles of the coast, that area is important to bowhead whale migrations, feeding, and calving. It just doesn't make sense to have lease sales there. So that was taken off the table. And that's how the other areas were there. The other area that's new, Hannah Shoal, that's an area in the Chukchi. Sorry, I don't have a map, but it's up there in the Northwest. Um, that is an area based on the science my agency has done, the science that NOAA has done, the science that Fish and Wildlife has done, and the science the oil and gas industry has done, has shown that that area is very important biologically, and also for subsistence hunters. That's where the walruses like to go and feed. And so there are communities that harvest the walrus. So that's an area the president felt, you know, not compatible. So that's how these decisions are made. Okay, there was a mention about oil and gas regulations. Well, we do have a national program of regulations for oil and gas activity on the outer continental shelf. And some of them are very specific to the Arctic. But after some of the little problems that occurred in the winter of 2012 and 2013 when Shell was demobilizing, we decided to take a harder look at that. And so looking at that, a team got together, three minutes, I'm almost there. Um, we have caught, got draft proposed regulations that will be released any day now. I mean, it could have been today. And it covers these topics, uh, unique Arctic conditions, 
codifying the things we required of Shell in 2012, uh, ensuring early planning and risk minimization, and addressing issues identified to the Secretary of the Interior in a report that we did. So there's not going to be a lot of surprises. Read the Secretary's report. Look what we required of Shell. It's going to be there. Okay, two more slides. What's on our table? Okay, this is the outer continental shelf of Alaska in the Arctic, larger than the Gulf of Mexico. There is the possibility of Shell exploring in 2015. That's one company possible, two wells. We have a development and production plan, okay, from Hillcore. I mentioned how there is a joint federal state gravel island that taps into the federal and state resources. Well, that's in state waters. We now have a development and production plan that would actually be in the official OCS about five miles into the Beaufort. It's by Hillcore. Construction would start no earlier than 2018. We got an environmental impact statement to do. Uh, production no sooner than 220. Uh, we've got ongoing G&G &G survey activities going on. We have our five-year program that was just announced. And then we have the Arctic proposed regulations. And for my last slide, let's summarize here. 37 years in the Alaska OCS, 25 lease sales in the Arctic, three in the Chukchi, 10 in the Beaufort. 86 exploration wells, six in the Chukchi, 31 in the Beaufort. The most recent, two top holes in 2012, one in the Beaufort, one in the Chukchi. The only production in the federal OCS in 37 years of all of this is North Star, which is a joint federal state unit. We now have one exploration plan and we're reviewing for Shell and one development and production plan from Hillcourt. So when we talk about a topic, you know, a race for Arctic resources, let's also consider the pace of that race. Some people are gonna like this for some reason, some folks are not gonna like it for others. But one thing I found moving to Alaska from DC, the level of coordination and collaboration that goes on is like no other. I know all my federal executives in Alaska, we meet regularly. Okay, we meet with the native com communities. Uh, Edward Ita was one of the first native Alaskans I met. He became a mentor. He put his arm around me in his office and said, Jim, I'm gonna tell you how to operate up here. And I got Reggie Jewell up here. Reggie has been a big help. But we talk to people up here. We collaborate and coordinate. And so the decisions are being made, are being made with a lot of thought, and we're doing the best we can to make sure things are done in the best interest of everyone. Thank you very much. Well, it's getting late in the day, so I hope people can make it through a few more presentations. I am, I'm very happy to be here, and I want to thank the University of Washington Law School, but also Rachel, who really impresses me being a law student. My husband is a law professor, so I know how hard it is to be a law student and put on a major conference like this. I don't know how you did it, Rachel, but great job, and it's going really well. Um, so I'm going to talk about the change that's been happening in the Arctic, as everyone has. Um, and, you know, as it's been discussed, uh, change is occurring very rapidly. Uh, the Arctic is warming at twice the rate of the rest of the planet. Communities are affected by uh, storms, flooding, erosion, um, and they have minimal resources to respond. Uh, there's been impacts to ice-dependent uh, wildlife, such as walrus and ice seals, which in turn impacts subsistence hunting and ice as the ice cover is lost. Um, and these impacts are being compounded by all of the things we've been hearing about today, increased shipping, fisheries, and oil and gas. Um, in order to mi mitigate these impacts, and that's why we put together a program at Pew Charitable Trust, um, we've promoted a precautionary approach with four pillars, uh, science and traditional knowledge, strong Arctic standards, um, prevention and response and safety, uh, identification and protection of important marine and subsistence areas, and meaningful engagement of local communities, tribes, and native organizations. Um, 
they need to be at the table to be involved in the decisions facing them and where they want their communities to go. Fran and Adriana talked about the priorities of the U.S. Arctic um, Council, and we strongly support those goals. Uh, but however, our efforts internationally are only as strong as our actions at home. Um, other countries look to the U.S. Uh, we are uh, leaders, and we need to set the bar high. We need to set a good example for countries to follow. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit today, about how I think we are doing that already and where we need to proceed or continue to do that. For example, the state of Alaska has um, just released their report that's been discussed, the Arctic Policy um, Committee put out their report, and a bill has been introduced in the legislature by um, Representative Heron, and he's very excited about that, and I think that report really is, uh, shows the priority that the state is putting on, on the Arctic. But also, Governor Walker has established a cabinet-level position to address Arctic issues, and Craig Fleener's here. No governor in the history of the state of Alaska has ever had anyone at that high a level working on Arctic issues, so I think that's very important. And the federal government, there's been a lot of improvement and leadership shown. Uh, late last year, um, the incredible fisheries and subsistence resources of Bristol Bay were permanently protected by President Obama. This is an issue for 30 years. People have battled to protect that region and make fish the priority. And they finally got a win to make sure that fisheries remain the priority in that region. Um, just this week, President, as uh, Jim Kendall pointed out this week, President Obama announced that important subsistence and marine mammal foraging, feeding, and migration areas in the Chukchi Sea and the Beaufort Sea are permanently off limits to offshore oil and gas. The Coast Guard has released first ever draft recommendations for shipping routes in the Bering Sea and the Bering Strait, and a coalition of five marine mammal co-management groups played a major role in establishing the newly created Arctic Waterway Safety Committee. For some reason, of course, this happens to everyone up here. Your mouth gets very dry when you're trying to give a speech. Okay, so and then finally, the Arctic Maritime Prevention and Response Network has begun to build capacity to respond to vessel accidents and spills. And the Marine Exchange, where I was earlier this week, is actually tracking vessels transiting the Arctic and making sure they stay out of harm's way. This is an impressive list, and I think it would definitely compete with any other country in the Arctic. Um, but we need to stay vigilant. We cannot be complacent. And uh, because a, a major accident in the Arctic, an oil spill would be devastating. Um, so I have a few ways where I think we can continue to improve on um, and show leadership in the Arctic. First, um, in the Aleutian Islands and in the Bering Strait on shipping, the Aleutian Islands risk assessment recommendations are, the, the draft is out and they should be finalized very soon. This is about, you know, increased towing, salvage, spill response capabilities in, in the Aleutians and also areas to be avoided. Um, as soon as these recommendations come out, they should be, uh, implemented. This is a, an incredible, this is the way to do public policy right. It is agencies, federal and state, um, NGOs, uh, communities, experts coming together to figure out what are the safest ways uh, to operate in the Aleutians with all the vessels transiting. Um, managing increased shipping in the 40 mile wide Bering Strait. It, this is challenging because it's an international strait. Um, and most measures, in order for all the vessels that are transiting uh, through the strait, the regulations need to go through the IMO. But there are still measures that the U.S. and the state of Alaska can implement domestically that set higher standards of care for vessels in the region. Um, there are threats that uh, can be mitigated, and those include noise, 
um, for marine mammals. Whale strikes, which could be very harmful because every um, fall and spring, the entire bowhead whale migration goes through that narrow 40 mile strait. And if there are major vessels uh, going through that strait, it will be very important that there is knowledge about what, that, what the migration is happening. Um, and of course, oil spills and then um, conflicts with hunters in small vessels. Uh, many of the communities that Alice Rogoff pointed out, they hunt marine mammals in very small skiffs. And when a major tanker or uh, ship is coming through, they cannot see those small vessels. So there's more work to be done to make sure that those conflicts are uh, dealt with. The um, communities and the marine mammal hunters know the waters best, and they are the ones that have the most to lose if there's an accident. So they need to be at the table. One of the things Pew did last year was to help support COERIC, the native nonprofit for the Bering Straits region, um, hold a conference where they could bring all the tribal leaders together um, to talk about their concerns about shipping in the Bering Strait. And uh, their report should be out soon, but um, some of the areas, and I happen to be lucky enough to be, sit and listen to that meeting, um, some of the biggest areas of concern is, uh, are uh, avoiding important subsistence areas and designation of no discharge zones um, in important marine and subsistence areas. Um, and then additionally, we've got to figure out how to increase response capability and prevention capability in the Bering Strait, um, given the extreme conditions and the lack of infrastructure to respond. Um, there's efforts being done, but there needs to be more. Uh, at, at the IMO, uh, they made very good progress and they should be coming out with their final uh, rules in 2017, as Lawson talked about. But um, we're missing a few things, like there should be a ban on heavy fuel, which is the most difficult to clean up. If you have a spill of heavy fuel oil, um, you know, it is going to be very damaging to marine life. But if we can start using alternatives to heavy fuel, uh, a spill would not be nearly as damaging. Um, offshore drilling, as Jim Kendall talked about, is um, I think about balance. Uh, one of the things I learned when I worked in government uh, has been that, you know, there has to be a balance. You can't overreach. Overreaching just causes backlash. But I think what we have happening right now in the Arctic Ocean is a balance. Um, we have to have standards, strong standards, and we need to have science-informed policies. Um, as I mentioned, and, J and Jim mentioned, there were uh, millions of acres put off limits. These are acreage that are really important for walrus foraging, for um, uh, marine mammal migration, for the health and res resilience of the Arctic Ocean, but also for people who hunt, and, and you heard it from Edward, nobody says it better than Edward, you know, people who live there, and it's, you know, this is their way of life, and this is their culture, and it's their, um, you know, it's so important subsistence to the communities. Now, these deferrals aren't new, as Jim mentioned. Uh, they have all, almost all been deferred, or these withdrawals, I should say, permanent withdrawals, have all been um, deferred in past plans, including in the Bush administration. The 25-mile buffer, um, parts of Barrow Canyon, Kaktovik, um, these are not new. So um, some of the areas are new, but they were based on science and traditional knowledge. And they've been supported by hunters and local um, communities in the past. And the target leasing approach, which I think is very important for the Arctic, which balances um, areas that need to be safeguarded and areas that, you know, where drilling can take place. 
The last thing I'm going to talk about is Arctic specific standards. And um, I didn't get a chance to mention this because I skipped over it, but um, I want to say there's been a real change uh, in the way the government is re regulating offshore drilling in our country. Um, I have watched it. I, as was mentioned, I've worked on these issues for many years in Alaska. I'm a survivor of the Exxon Valdez oil spill, as Rachel is. And, um, you know, we, we really need to um, make sure that we, sorry, uh, we really need to make sure that we get this balance right. And um, this target at least, or the, I, I know what I was saying, the, um, the agencies, even though the Congress has not passed any legislation as they did after the Exxon Valdez, they, did pa they didn't pass legislation after the Gulf spill. And so um, what has happened is the agency had to take that responsibility and the culture has truly changed. When you talk to Jim Kendall or Mark Fessmeyer, who run um, the programs at Bohm and Bessie, uh, it is really a change of culture and a change of approach. It's an open door, there's transparency, people understand what is happening. So on the Arctic specific drilling standards, and I'll just take a minute on this because I only have a few left. Um, so we believe we have to have strong, world-class standards in the Arctic for drilling. Um, an example of what's been a very effective way to, to mitigate impacts of drilling is the conflict avoidance agreement. Um, these are a negotiation between the hunters and the oil industry, and it is, it is voluntary, really. The industry has been willing to do this, which has been great, but they can address things like discharge or um, how to avoid whales, and it is a very important part of development up in the Arctic. Um, so the Department of Interior, as you've heard, is about to release standards, and um, some of the most important prevention and response standards that we've been advocating for uh, and a lot of them come out of the fact that we watched what happened in the Gulf and we knew that there were no Arctic specific standards. The regulations that are used um, right now for um, regulating the Arctic uh, drilling are the same as what is used in the Gulf. And so that's being remedied with these regulations that we'll soon see a draft of, um, but the things we've been advocating for are having a backup rig in the region that is available to immediately drill a relief well in the case of a blowout, uh, capping and containment system located in the region capable of being deployed immediately if there is a, uh, a blowout, um, seasonal drilling limitations that require a drilling hiatus during whaling and times when spill response is virtually impossible due to ice. Um, and this includes factoring in the time it would take to drill a relief uh, well or cap a well before ice moves in. Um, of course, having adequate trained personnel and equipment capable of responding to a worst case discharge in the Arctic and having ice capable vessels and equipment that are tested in the Arctic and ready to operate in the Arctic. Ultimately, to do development right in the Arctic, the U.S. needs to make sure we remain vigilant and continuously improve the policies and capabilities we have in place and ensure we protect health, ecosystem health, and the way of life that has been practiced for time immemorial in the Arctic. And as the U.S. assumes the chairmanship and considers ways to lead on the stewardship both at home and internationally, they will be most successful if they fully engage the people who live in the Arctic and help with get their help in guiding the policy decisions. Thank you. First off, uh, thank you, the University of uh, Washington Law School, for hosting this. 
Rachel and your team for creating this, this conversation. I, uh, I think it is in time for a dialogue, and there's obviously strong feelings and, and a lot of emotions around this. But I'm going to take a minute. There's a characteristic that I've really come to appreciate about Alaskans, especially my friends from the way north, and that's their sense of humor and their ability to enjoy whatever, whatever God gave them that day. So we're the last act of this afternoon, right before happy hour. I'm going to ask you to indulge me a little bit on that. It won't be quite so serious. You'll notice the young man in there, and you'll get a sense of just how long this has been going on when you compare that young man to the one standing in front of you right now. So what we're going to do, what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to watch a little short movie. It's cut from, uh, uh, from many hours of VHS that we took when, when I was drilling in the uh, Chukchi Sea in 1989. And so Steve did a great job with that, cut it down to about four minutes. You're going to see the big bit, the 21-foot bit. You're going to see the rig moving on location. You're going to see lots of boats and guys working, and, and I hope you enjoy that. And then I'm going to show you a whole lot of pictures and try and tell you a little bit about it. So um, mainly this is, this is a look back, okay? See that 21 foot bit? The Explorer 3. And that, you saw the outline of the, the hole. And there's the bit again. History. This is the first new bit, new design. Well, tell it's us the first time I ever seen one. Tell us a little bit about it. I don't know. It looked like a dead just hair of an old farm boy like me. Thank you. 
I'm gonna tell Stan and Bill I've never seen a foreman take all night to get that them paperwork in there. What do you think? Yeah, there have been several did that. Most of them got a little quicker than this. <laughs> Most of them learned to do it quicker. All right. Be sorry. Hope you enjoy that. There's a, there's a lot of it, but it's like a home video, you know. You have to have a little taste for it. <laughs> uh, you might have noticed I must have been a little camera shy. I think that's the only shot they could find of me in the, in the, in the uh, video. Most of that was 1989. You saw pic you saw shots from the windows of the icebreaker, looking out over the the water. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, well, real quickly about me, I. I I actually, you know, Monk's Hood and Fern, two wells drilled off of Dutch Harbor. Uh, I got to experience the winter of 84, 85, bouncing around on the biggest rig in the world. I really understand those oceans a lot better after that. Um, we spent eight days trying to get our anchors run, but we drilled two wells then. And um, the Beaufort, Chuck GC, I finished up in 89, and, and then um, I went to the deep water Gulf of Mexico. Um, right now, I'm a husband, a dad, and a grandpa. That's probably the... Go ahead, Steve. A guy, I was driving the Robert Lemoore in the Beaufort Sea before we could get on location. This is, um, this is just a... This is from your website, Jim, I think. And we, we, we really barred shamelessly. The, the, there's the leases and all the wells, you know, just kind of give you a sense of where the, the wells have been drilled. About 30 in the U.S. Beaufort and five in the U.S. Chuck Chi, 40-something wells elsewhere. I think your count came up to about 100, including the stratigraphic test, don't you? And then there's 92 wells been drilled that were drilled in the Canadian Beaufort. And that's, that's the one thing Jim didn't touch on, and I'm glad I have, because otherwise he pretty much got my presentation. You know, the Can Canadians have led a lot of things, and um, they really started their search for oil in the... In the um, in the Canadian Beaufort in the early 70s. I think the last count, 92 wells drilled in the Canadian Beaufort. Okay, go ahead. And, and they pioneered the basic well design, and, and this was one of the original bits, um, the 21 foot bit that would make the, 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 they called it a glory hole, and uh, when we restarted, that was during the days before the internet, and. Needless to say, once we started talking about it again, we had to change the name of it. So the, the glory hole there is designed to, um, to, to protect you from ice scour by um, allowing you to, to uh, start your wellhead and your, your blowout preventers below the surface. So this is the, this is the same design that's used today. Go ahead. Uh, the one thing that they certainly had a lot of was summer ice. This is a picture that, that uh, 1984, right before when we were still looking at doing the drilling in the 85, 86 campaign in the Beaufort. Go ahead. I'll try to keep up fine with these. Um, in the early days, fooling with um, trying to understand where the ice was and what, how to manage it and, you know, our protocols, satellites were not as effective because they couldn't look through clouds. So we, we would run an airborne saw, it cost $35,000, and I had to really need it to ask for that, to run the airborne saw. i get a 30-foot photo that we'd put on the wall, and it would give us a view of the ice all the way upstream. The alternative to that, which my boss liked a lot better, was to put me in a helicopter with a tablet in my lap, and let me go draw the ice on the... So, you know, that was, that, this is what the Canadians were looking at. They actually tried to drill year-round. And they built the Culloch with that in mind, okay? And there's, there's the Culloch behind uh, a couple of their Canadian icebreakers. Uh, 
Uh, right, but go back one. Steve, this is this is one of their big. I think this is the Terry Fox. This is one of their, they really pioneered design for icebreakers. Very effective, and many of these are in the Russian fleet now. Go ahead, and another shot of the Kulik in pretty heavy ice and not so bad ice. And, and go ahead, uh, Steve. And they were also smart enough to realize that not everything required a floating rig. So this is a, a package that they, they built of a, um, uh, a barge and, a, a, pla and, a, and a, um, a base. They would work in up to 80 foot of water and you could freeze it in and work it in the winter time. It's a very different operation than, than running from the ice. This one you, you, uh, you built your system within the ice closer to shore. Go ahead. Go ahead. And then, you know, the Canadians, we found, this is from my old files, that in the, in the 70s and 80s, they were pioneering all manner of oil spill response techniques, including, you know, experiments with burning and, and with um, burning-type booms and such. Okay. Okay, did you know how much seismic has been run in these waters? Go ahead. Well, for those of you who aren't familiar with seismic, here's an example of it. There's two pictures of the, the guns and the, the, the acoustics being dragged behind the, the, um, the vessel. The, the overall sound source with hydrophones to receive, it takes the echo and maps the surface. These are fairly controversial because of the, um, the, you know, the potential for sound impact to uh, marine mammals who, who are in that area. So go ahead. Steve, and just, this is 1994 map showing the seismic lines that have already been run at that point in both the Beaufort and Chuck Chi Sea. I'd say this doesn't include any of the, of the recent stuff or the 3D seismic that, that was run in the uh, Chuck Chi Sea recently. And there's even seismic going on this year in the Beaufort. So it's uh, just for your information, okay? So that was, this is kind of a play on what you did earlier, Jim. This is kind of the Gulf of Alaska with 12 wells, 13 in the Cook Inlet, and 24 in the Bering Sea, exploratory wells. Uh, you know, Navarin Basin is so far out that it was about a four-hour hel four helicopter ride from Coal Bay. It was, it was not a pleasant thing if you had, couldn't, it got so, the weather was so bad that you had to turn around and come back, and that happened a few times. And they built, they didn't have a port out there either, what what Amico and the consortium of the partners did there was a wear ship, very effective for something so remote. Okay, that's Monk's Hood and Fern. That's the Ocean Odyssey. Go ahead. Some more examples. So in, on the U.S. side, um, a lot of the early Beaufort work and Jim would talk to this. The early exploration wells and um, one of the preferences was in less than 2,500 foot of water was to build a gravel island. You know, much much more than 25 foot of water, it became uneconomic. That's, uh, I think that's Seal Island there, Jim. Okay. Another one. And another one. And this is the this is the Explorer too in the Beaufort Sea. I was on there in 1985 and 86. We drilled two wells, Corona and Hammerhead. Okay. Um, this is the Robert Lemoore icebreaker. I got a, uh, you know, we were we were early in the season and um, had a chance to drive a little bit. <laughs> Who's that young guy? Okay. Go ahead. That's the Robert Lemoore. Supplier three. Go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. And the, you know, the Explorer 3, another Canmore rig is a little bit bigger. These, the Canmore rig, the 2 and the 3, you know, were both um, uh, converted and used through the 70s and 80s by the uh, Canadians. And then we picked them up for drilling over here. And the same, these are the same locations that Shell is looking at now, Burger and Klondike and Cracker Jack and Popcorn that we were looking at then. Okay, go ahead. You might see the... 
Marine mammal? Okay. That was a lot of ice, huh? This is the Chukchi Sea in 1989. Okay. 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 This we got to see if we get our timing right on this one, Steve. Um, you know, I was a young man, but I, I still very much recall the um, the respect and appreciation I had for where I was and what I was doing, the responsibilities that we had for for our our mission. And you know, I remember the people, and I remember the the, the beautiful world I was working in. We had a strong team. We had respect for others. In 1985, the Conflict Avoidance Agreement was called an oil whaler agreement, and it was printed on waterproof paper so that the whalers could take it in their boat. One page was a new pit, and the other side was English. That was the first one in 1986. We spent a lot of time preparing and a lot of time communicating. Once again, I took the picture, I think. Okay, Safe, clean, and respectful. That's what we said every day. Next. Um, you're only as good as your last morning report. That was my last one, October 1989. And uh, so a little bit of advice for all those who aspire to do something in the Arctic. Uh, don't get discouraged. <laughs> the locals will have a high interest in what you're doing. Some of them will be skeptical. But after a while, they'll relax and, and, uh, and appreciate what you're doing there. <laughs> so thank you very much for your interest. I appreciate being here. Thank you for having me. We just have a few minutes for questions, but I guess um, I want to thank the panel, obviously, for a very thoughtful and I think a very uh, kind of interesting theme that Brendan started with, and I think resilience was the right R word that he used. And uh, uh, from Marilyn to Jim to Rick, I mean, th there's, there's 30 plus years of experience. They all had the same uh, central theme, that is the Arctic is different. We are approaching it different. I think that those who want to uh, explore and develop the Arctic are approaching it differently. And I think if, if you could sort of couch your questions in terms of you know, what, what, what looks like the future in the Arctic in terms of regulation, risk and reward, what are we doing better, uh, what do we need to do better, I think that, that would be the best way to kind of approach uh, the panel and the, and the theme that we had today. So we've got uh, 10 minutes, Rachel, is that what you want? We've got one already, sir. sir. Uh, this is a question for Jim Kendall. My name is Mackenzie Funk. I'm a magazine journalist. And uh, about the amount of oil in the Chukchi, I've seen the rev revised, the draft environmental impact statement says 4.3 billion barrels. But I've also heard the number from BOEM, both of these, of 15 billion barrels. I suppose one is technically recoverable and one is over the next seven decades or something. But are, are we thinking that far out? I mean, can you reconcile those two numbers for me? Because they've never really made sense. Okay, uh, I'll try. Uh, it does get complicated. There's the technically recoverable resources that is just if money was no option, what could you possibly pull out? Then there's the economically recoverable resources where if you determine that a price of oil, a barrel is such and such, how much could you get out or the company could get out and still make a profit? Um, when I said 15.3 billion barrels, that's for the entire Chuck Chi. That is a guesstimate. I'd say a guesstimate based on some of the seismic information that was just shown on the screen. Now, as for the numbers you saw in the revised or the second supplemental EIS that was released uh, before Christmas, this is kind of strange because we're updating an EIS after the lease sale occurred. Usually, you're doing an environmental impact statement before a sale. You don't know where the company's interested. You don't know where the companies are going to buy leases. You have to look at all that data and give it your best shot. In this case, when we did the supplemental EIS, it was after the lease sale. We knew exactly where the lease blocks were that were you know, acquired 
by the oil companies. There was additional um, geological information from G&G &G surveys that had been done since the lease sale, and that factored into those calculations. So the numbers do bounce around a lot, depending on exactly what you're talking about, whether it's very specific or region-wide. And also, we have to remember that at this stage, they're basically all estimates. You really don't know until companies go out there and explore. That's why the OCS Lands Act sets it up the way it is. You have the first phase is what's the five-year program, okay? Then the second phase is actually having lease sales. The third phase is exploration to see what's there. And then the fourth phase is actual development. That occurs over decades so that at each point you can use the additional information you acquire both from the environment and from any drilling that's done. That's sort of a long-winded answer to your question. I hope I covered it. <laughs> hmm? Hmm? Any other questions from this panel? Okay, Rich, we're back on time, and uh, thank you guys very, very much. It was very interesting. Thank you.